Hey guys, welcome back. Sorry it's been a while. My CNC broke on me and my old comp measurement computer broke on me all within a couple weeks apart. So I've been spending a lot of money and spending a lot of time trying to get things back on track. Also, I want to mention, I hope everyone had a good uh, Remembrance Day. That's what we call it up here in Canada. I think it's Veterans Day or Memorial Day down in the States. I should know that. My wife is American. Uh, but anyways, thank you to all those who have served. Um, I, I'm not one of those people and I'm gracious and, and thankful to those of you who have. Anyways, getting to the point of this video, I had uh, probably seven or eight people send me crossovers. Some of them even sent me revisions to the uh, original submission. So that was better than I expected. I, I didn't think that many people... I wondered if anyone would. Maybe it'd just be my crossover I'm showing you guys today. But I actually had a lot of submissions and I had to go through them and I tried to pick some of the most well-rounded ones. None of them were bad. They were all really good. So it was just a matter of picking the crossovers that had um, shown different ideas and uh, that I could talk about so it wasn't all the same thing over and over again. And I really wanted to show more but I picked four and even that was pushing it. I probably should have stuck to just three and plus my own. So anyways, let's start there and then we'll get to the other uh, submissions as we go along. So the first thing I did was model up a crossover in XSIM for myself and started soldering it together. Um, I wanted to hear this thing right away so I didn't have much patience and I put it together and had a listen before anybody else even sent me a crossover. This is my crossover that I started with. This is version one. At the time of this video, I hadn't listened to any other versions. This is what I stuck with because I didn't want to taint my opinion of anything. And you can see it's basically a uh, second order filter on the tweeter with a basic L pad. You can see C3, uh, that capacitor is shorted out and L3, three that inductor is also shorted out so it's a second order on the woofer as well but it's slightly damped with that uh, one ohm resistor in there and also the 0.33 microfarad cap acts as kind of a an open notch i guess you could say it really suppresses the high frequencies of the woofer so that's kind of a shaping circuit once i got that crossover figured out in xm i wired it up as you see here and i actually made a mistake wiring it up Okay, so as you saw there, I took three measurements. I took a measurement of the speaker itself fully wired up, um, a measurement of just the woofer, and a measurement of just the tweeter. And I did this for each speaker. I'm using a new laptop here, I had computer issues. So I'm dealing with a new computer, new calibration. It's not fully dialed in and the microphone was only a half a meter away. So there's a little extra energy at you know, between 800 and 2000 hertz, and also the high frequencies have a bit of a peak dip peak combo. The calibration I haven't fully worked out yet, so just be mindful of that. So, on this slide here, you can see the red measured result versus the XSIM prediction. As mentioned, you can see things are a little bit hot around 1000 hertz and the top octave is a little bit funky. Otherwise, other than that, we're getting really good agreement and this is about what I would expect from a simulation to a real world measurement. It's not going to be bang on every time. It just I've never had that happen. I've had it very close, but this is fairly normal. In hindsight, I should have backed the mic up to a meter, but I was going quickly here. I had a lot of crossovers to deal with. Uh, you can see I left the response a little bit tilted up. Um, this is because it's a desktop speaker and I thought full baffle step compensation might not be a good way to go. In hindsight, I find it a bit thin sounding. It sounds very good. The speaker has a ton of potential, but I am going to beat that down to about 85 dB. The crossover is around 1500 hertz. That seems to be working. I don't hear any bad nasty sounds out of the tweeter. I'm I'm pleased with the quality of the sound so far. Um, so I'm I'm okay with this low crossover and this low crossover is intentional. So once I got done with the measurements, I pulled off my crossover and I started wiring up Mr. O's crossover. Mr. O's crossover is very simple. It's six parts total, second order on the tweeter and on the woofer with a traditional L-pad. That made wiring it up really nice and easy. 
um, so this didn't take too long. And by the end of this video, you'll see how much wiring I did. Took a measurement. And here are the results. Overlaid with XM, you can see, again, we're getting pretty good agreement with everything. And again, I apologize for the top octave and the extra energy around 1000 hertz. The speaker had a sensitivity of about 85, 86 dB, uh, which is pretty respectful. It's pretty much a flat, uh, you know, full baffle step compensation result, which is good. This is what we're trying to achieve, I believe. Well done there. Mr. O's crossover point is only 3 dB down at 1800 hertz for each driver. So what this tells me is that they're out of phase by 90 degrees. Now, it may be that Mr. O knew this and was paying attention to the forward lobe and possibly as you sit up in your seat and you're above the speaker, these things come really into phase and this was genius. Or Mr. O wasn't quite aware of this and it's something if you're watching this, um, maybe pay attention to that in the future. It's not necessarily wrong to be out of phase, especially 90 degrees out of, uh, keep it in mind. And also the woofer uh, breakup isn't totally suppressed. So this is, you know, kind of the trade-off of having a simple crossover. So you can see it's 20 dB down, which is not unreasonable. And this woofer has a really clean breakup. So it may be that Mr. O is fully aware of this and had no problem with that. And guess what? It probably doesn't sound bad. So there's nothing wrong here. I just want to point those two things out. The tweeter has a really weird shape to it at the lower knee that doesn't match the original measured results or the simulated results. And I, to be honest, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, Mr. D, the next crossover we're going to look at, has a similar kind of anomaly. In any case, I'm going to ignore that and assume something just didn't go right there. It's nothing to do with the crossover. So next up, take off the old crossover and start putting on the new one. Here we go again. This is Mr. D's crossover. This uses a third order electrical filter on the tweeter and a second order electrical filter on the woofer. Uh, what's interesting here is it doesn't have a traditional L pad. It has a resistor in front of the filter that basically works as a power sink. You'll notice it also has that small cap around the primary woofer inductor to act as a notch. Okay, here's the measured results. We can see a few things going on. It seems I may not have hooked up that, that capacitor, that small capacitor quite right because the woofer is not filtered out as much as uh, XM predicted. The tweeter has that really funky shape to it in the lower knee. So it's possible my alligator clips weren't, you know, secure or something. But if you look at the XM overlay here, we are getting good agreement. Okay, so you can see the mids are a little bit scooped. You have about an 86 dB speaker with an 84 dB suppressed mid-range. This is kind of that smiley face EQ. Um, that sounds bad, but to be honest, that's what a lot of people like. They kind of like that suppressed mid-range, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So the crossover point is quite high at 2600 hertz. Um, I wasn't able to explain it in detail, but in part three, under design goals, I talked about having a low crossover point. So although this was not a bad choice when using this tweeter, that's probably the perfect crossover point for say a living room speaker or especially home theater speaker, you'd probably want to even cross higher. But for this application, I am looking for a lower crossover. And here we go again. As you can imagine, I was starting to get tired of using alligator clips, but it had to be done. Okay, this is uh, Mr. J. And this crossover, I was really impressed with this. It uses a lot of parts. I think we have 11 parts in here, if I'm not mistaken. It's a third order filter on the tweeter and a fourth order filter on the woofer. The woofer filter uses a bit of damping on the second leg and it has a traditional L pad, but you can see there's two series resistors wired in parallel. Now this is for extra power handling in that resistor. And I think this is a really good method. Um, it's a, I, I do it often with my crossovers as well. The only thing I would mention is it has an extra part and in a desktop speaker like this, that's rarely going to see more than 10, 20 watt peaks at most. Um, it's probably unnecessary, but hey, resistors are like two bucks. So really this is, unless you don't have room on your PCB or something like that, there's no reason to not do this.
there were a lot of parts to wire up on this one. It was quite a pain, and um, I had to rob a couple parts off of my crossover as well. But in the end, I think I got it, and everything was wired up properly, which I was shocked. When I f took the first measurement, I thought I was going to find something nasty. But everything worked out, as you can see. Um, we didn't get that weird thing happening with the tweeter, and everything is where it's supposed to be. You can see in the overlay that things match fairly well, and I was pleased to see that I got this one wired up right. Everything was, is fairly well aligned, accounting for that top octave squiggle and the extra energy around 1000 hertz. So overall, I was really pleased to see how accurately this thing measured. Okay, so the crossover was about 87 dB sloping down towards about 85 dB. Now this is the kind of voicing that a lot of people like, especially in a living room speaker. I'm a bit unsure how this will sound in a desktop setup because it is going to have some boundary reinforcement off the desk and things like that. But overall, a lot of people like this kind of voicing. Um, and it's a nice smooth downward slope. So overall, well done Mr. J. This is quite good, especially if this crossover could really work well if you have kind of a near field listening situation for, say, you want to five identical surround speakers in an apartment or something like that, and you can't listen very loud. This could sound really good. The crossover point was about 1700 hertz, and you can see that both drivers are about 6 dB down. I can tell you from the XM simulation that Mr. J took the time to make sure these drivers were perfectly in phase. It's clear that the extra parts and everything put into this were to get things very precise, and it shows up in the measurements. These things are perfectly in phase, and they have nice smooth roll-offs, and everything is working together very nicely. So again, job well done. The woofer breakup is only 20 dB down. Um, that's something to think about. But as mentioned with Mr. D's crossover, this woofer has a pretty benign breakup, and I bet you this sounds totally fine. But if there's anything to complain about in this crossover, it would be that that could be suppressed a little bit more. But to be honest, I doubt that's audible. Okay, one last crossover to wire up here. Man, by this point, I was really cold. <laughs> My hands were freezing. Um, I was really done with doing this. So anyways, here we go. This is Mr. M's crossover. This was quite unique. Um, here you can see that it's a second order filter on the tweeter with a conventional L pad and then an impedance uh, contouring circuit of some kind. And then on the woofer, we have second order filter as well with a Zobel network to compensate for the impedance on this driver as well. I will say that the 56 microfarad cap is a little bit expensive, but you could use a electrolytic capacitor or something like that on a budget speaker like this, and really that's not too much of an audio sin if you ask me. Getting all these alligator clips together was a nightmare. I don't know if I'll be doing this again, guys. It's just a ton of work. <laughs> okay, so here's the measured results. Everything looks to be in order. Nothing too crazy or weird looking. So let's compare it to the XM results. You can see that things did line up fairly well, especially down in the woofer range. Maybe a little bit hotter than predicted in the tweeter range, and of course there's a little more energy. Actually, the, the excess energy in the mid-range has shifted more towards 2000 Hz. So what makes Mr. M's crossover extra unique is that there's basically no baffle step compensation. This has a very tilted upwards response until you get to the tweeter range, and then it's downward tilted. And I think what he was going for here was again in a desktop near field situation. Uh, sometimes speakers can sound really bloated, especially when they have too much uh, boundary reinforcement and things like that. So this crossover actually has the most potential to sound perfect. Unfortunately, Mr. M, I have given these speakers a listen with my crossover at least, and they sounded a little bass shy. So I got a good feeling this is actually not gonna sound right. Um, that's not me saying this was a bad attempt. I think what you went for here was something really unique and could have been very successful. It's got a really low crossover at 1200 hertz, which is also a gutsy move. 
And I think it would be okay. It does raise the question of Twitter distortion and stress and things like that. Again, these things are, you know, rarely going to see more than a watt, definitely rarely more than 10 or 20 watts peak. So it could work. Um, the crossover isn't perfectly in phase, not a big deal, but these are some things to think about. I think this was an excellent attempt with some gutsy choices. Let's put it that way. Overall, um, had my speaker sounded really full and maybe bloated, I probably would have wired this up and given it a shot. All right, there it is, guys. I hope that was somewhat helpful, uh, at least to the people who submitted. Hopefully you saw some things or learned some things and maybe even inspired you to try designing your own crossover and XM yourself. Stick around for future videos. We're going to do part five of this series. We're going to basically talk about my next revision and, and actually my, my final crossover design, how it sounds, and uh, start putting together grills and stuff maybe, little speaker stands, talk about my listening position. And also stick around for more driver testing and uh, pretty soon I'm going to get into a pretty cool three-way design. Thanks guys. Bye.